Thank you all so much for joining us. It's um, my pleasure to welcome you to today's Back to Class. I'm Martha Beatty, class of 76, and at the helm of alumni relations these days. Um, my colleagues from Dartmouth um, and I would like to thank you for your presence here and for joining us for Dartmouth's entrepreneurial mindset, bringing research to life, which I, will, I, I know you will appreciate hearing from these um, scholars and, um, and great thinkers and entrepreneurs sitting to my left. Um, Danielle Sparks, who runs our Dartmouth on Location uh, program, and others in alumni relations are working hard to create these lifelong <coughs> learning opportunities for all alumni. Um, through our travel uh, program, uh, Dartmouth on Locations around the country and the world, and events just like this one this morning. So I encourage you to stay um, in tune to all of those, to check um, out when they're happening and where they're happening by visiting our alumni relations website as often as you choose to at alumni.dartmouth.edu. I have been given the uh, role of reminding everybody that cell phones should be silent, so please, if you don't mind, checking on that, that would be great. Good Thanks point. very much. Um, now, I'm pleased to introduce today's moderator for our panel, the Dean of the Thayer School of Engineering, a professor of en engineering, and one of Dartmouth's true teacher scholars. Um, since 2005, Dean Joseph Helbley has led the Thayer School. He's ushered in a dynamic period of focus and growth. And in doing so, he has included this centering research around three key areas of societal needs. He is looking at engineering in medicine, engineering in energy, and engineering in complex systems, and has, with very strategic faculty hires, to make this all happen. Um, during his tenure, the numbers of students in each of the degree programs have grown to record levels, and in 2016, the Thayer School impressed the world by granting 54% of its undergraduate engineering degrees to women, making it the first national research university to award more bachelor's degrees in engineering to women than to men. Quite an accomplishment. His curricular accomplishments at Thayer School include founding the nation's first PhD innovative program to prepare doctoral candidates for entrepreneurial success. You can see why this panel today is going to be so special. For this, he was honored with the National Association of Engineering's 2014 Bernard M. Gordon Prize for Innovation in Energy Engineering and um, uh, Technology Education. Dean Helbley's research interests include air pollution and nanotechnology. He is the author of more than 100 publications and holds three US patents relating to nanoscale ceramic powders. He's a recipient of the National Science Foundation Career Award. He has also addressed technology and environmental policy initiatives in the US Senate, and he served on many EPA science advisory boards. He's on the editorial boards of Environmental Engineering Science, fuel processing technology, and currently chairs the Public Policy Committee of the American Society for Engineering Education and the Engineering Dean's Council. I am sure you are as relieved as I am that he is never bored. Uh, Dean Helbley received his bachelor's degree in chemical engineering from Lehigh University and his PhD in chemical engineering from MIT. I have known Joe since we worked together on a Dartmouth project in 2008, and I can assure you that he is the most personable, the most enthusiastic dean of any engineering school in the world. We are, we are in for a treat this morning. So with gratitude that he and his all-star panel, who he will introduce, could join us this morning, please welcome a friend and a colleague whom I admire greatly, Joe Helbley. Thank you, Martha, for that very kind introduction. Thank you all for joining us. You know, I, I can't help but comment the most enthusiastic, what did you say, an engaging engineering dean? That strikes me as a pretty low bar. <laughs> <laughs> With apologies to any of my colleagues out there who may be watching or listening in. So this morning, we're going to have a conversation around innovation and entrepreneurship and its central importance, we think, 
not just to the Thayer School of Engineering, but to helping faculty and students understand how to go beyond just studying something in the laboratory, but to truly impact and change the world. So I'm pleased and honored this morning to be joined by two of my faculty colleagues and a Dartmouth alumna and member of the Thayer School Board of Overseers. Just to give you a sense of the structure this morning, I'm going to take a few minutes to provide a little bit of background on each of our panelists and tell you about their accomplishments. I'm going to ask each of them a few questions about their background and their choices to pursue an entrepreneurial <coughs> path. Engage in a bit of a conversation with them around some of the projects they've worked on and then open it up to your questions and discussion. We will be mindful of the time in a football game and tailgate parties afterwards, and so we will bring our program to a close at 11.30 this morning, but the panelists and I would be happy to remain for a few minutes afterwards and engage in any individual conversation or answer any questions you may have. So with that, let me introduce our panelists. On my immediate left, Samantha Scholar Truex. Sam is a Dartmouth graduate receiving her AB degree in 1992, her BE from the Thayer School of Engineering in 1993, and her MBA from the Tuck School of Business in 1995. Sam is a biotech industry advisor, serving both as entrepreneur in residence at Atlas Ventures and as an advisor to multiple early stage companies, largely in the biotech space. Sam has more than 20 years of biotech corporate experience, including a COO and head of corporate development for Synlogic, where she led the strategic process and transaction culminating in the recent reverse merger with Myrna. Prior to Synlogic, she was chief business officer for Padlock Therapeutics, which was subsequently acquired by Bristol Myers Squibb. Sam has also spent several years each at Biogen <coughs> and Genzyme. So you can see she has a broad variety of corporate private sector experience at both large companies and more entrepreneurial focused smaller biotech concerns. Early in her career, Sam also worked for Chiron Diagnostics and Health Advances. In addition to being a member of the Thayer School Board, she has previously served on the Corporate Collaboration Council advising Thayer's MEM program and on Dartmouth Alumni Liaison Committee of the Alumni Council. So welcome, Sam. Seated next to Sam is Professor Tillman Gerngross, PhD, a professor of bioengineering at Dartmouth College, and as many in the Hanover community and Dartmouth community know, a very active entrepreneur and innovator. He has founded several successful companies, including Glycofy, where he engineered yeast to produce hu fully human glycoproteins. In 2006, this Upper Valley company was acquired by Merck in a record-setting transaction. In the same year, Nature Biotechnology named Tillman one of the most notable people in biotechnology of the prior decade. In 2007, he co-founded Atomab, which since has launched one of the most commercially successful antibody drug discovery technologies. In 2010, he co-founded Arsanis to develop antibody-based therapies for the treatment of infectious diseases. In 2012, he co-founded Avatide to address a bottleneck in the purification of protein-based therapeutics and in 2013, he co-founded Elector to develop new treatment strategies for dementia and Alzheimer's related diseases. As you can see, he is an extraordinarily active faculty member and entrepreneur, and for this in 2013, he was elected to the National Academy of Inventors, and in 2017, awarded our profession's highest honor election to the National Academy of Engineering. Finally, on my far left, it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Jason Stauff. Jason received his BE degree from the Thayer School of Engineering in 2000 and subsequently MS and PH degrees from UC Berkeley in 2006 and 2008. There he studied integrated circuits for wireless communication and power electronics. Professor Stouth has experience working in both large and small companies from designing sensors that were installed in nearly every car on the road to consulting for Panasonic on consumer electronics products in the world that only some of you can imagine, the world that existed before the iPad. As a graduate student at Berkeley, Jason also co-founded QV Sense Incorporated, which developed a new platform for distributed power management in large-scale photovoltaic systems. In 2009, QV Sense was acquired by the Indian manufacturing company Solar Semiconductor. Since 2011, Jason has been a member of the faculty at the Thayer School of Engineering 
an extraordinary teacher and scholar working in the area of power electronics. In 2016, a new startup company, Hive Battery Incorporated, was spun out of his research lab. He received the NSF Career Award for his early research and teaching prowess, and in 2017, I'm pleased to report, he was awarded tenure and promotion to associate professor, perhaps the most important accomplishment of all. So with that, please join me in welcoming our team. So as I said at the outset, innovation and entrepreneurship broadly are extraordinarily important to us at the Thayer School of Engineering. In fact, those of you who've heard me speak may have heard me note that at the Thayer School of Engineering a decade ago, one in four of our faculty members were technology-focused entrepreneurs, having started a company based on work in their laboratory. Today, that number is one in three. Thayer School is on, in the early stages of a plan of transformative growth in a partnership with computer science here at Dartmouth and the Dartmouth Entrepreneurial Network, bringing together the elements of innovation, entrepreneurship, coding, and engineering design our goal to be to do that in one centralized facility, a new facility on the west end of campus. As we build our faculty as part of this vision for a future of engineering and computation and innovation at Dartmouth, our goal is to build a faculty where one in two of our faculty members, fully one half, are technology focused entrepreneurs. And in doing that, we will make Dartmouth Thayer School of Engineering hands down the most entrepreneurially focused school of engineering on a per capita basis in this country. Now, why are we focused on this program of transformative growth, innovation, and entrepreneurship? Competitiveness, of course, is part of it. We like to be number one in things that we tackle. We want to be the best in our class, but we do it for a broader set of reasons. We do it because, as I said at the outset, this notion of putting our discoveries to work to benefit humanity, of commercializing invention that comes out of engineering, research, and scholarship is fundamentally what many of us believe society not only needs but expects and deserves from institutions of higher education focused on engineering and technology development. So this morning we have three extraordinary individuals who represent different elements of that focus and I'm hoping that the conversation around this subject will be both engaging and help all of us in the audience appreciate not only is this a nice thing to do at a college and at a school of engineering, but an essential thing to do. So let me start by turning to our panelists, and I'll start with Sam, and ask Sam if you could just tell, get us started by telling us in a, in a few minutes why you decided to go down this entrepreneurial path. Tell us a little bit about your background and transformation from working at large companies to being in a position where you're helping think about acquiring smaller companies or helping them to grow. Sure, thank you, uh, Joe. And, and that, um, the transition you just described for me occurred in 2014, officially, when I decided to leave uh, Biogen, which is a large biopharma company headquartered in Cambridge, Massachusetts, where I had been for about eight years. Uh, and prior to that, I had been a Genzyme for about eight years, and prior to that, Chiron. So these are all large, or at least in their existence at those times, were um, large biopharma companies. Although I didn't officially make a transition to a small startup until that time, most of my work in those um, 17 or so years at those three companies was in transactional business development and drug program leadership. And so in transactional business development, I spent a great deal of my time looking outward from those companies at innovations taking place in academia and at smaller companies and helping with a team of people from across all the functions you need to develop a, a successful drug um, to assess the technologies at those companies and determine whether collaborating with those companies or in some cases acquiring those companies might be a good idea for um, for the companies I was working for. So while I was not working myself as an entrepreneur, I had a lot of exposure to the companies that had been doing that in the drug development arena. And especially in 2012 to 14, I spent a good chunk of time for Biogen looking at gene therapy companies and really enjoyed uh, getting to know the people who were the entre entrepreneurs and the teams that those companies put together. And I realized that after having spent quite a bit of my time in the larger company setting and having a good run doing that, that it was maybe time for a change. And so I looked to 
get to know a number of um, companies and importantly the investors that back those companies and eventually um, made a switch to join the company Padlock Therapeutics. And uh, I think later we may get into more, uh, you know, how one would choose which company is a good um, bet perhaps to spend some time with. But what I also want to mention about entrepreneurship is I feel that I've had the good fortune also to come at this from another perspective, which is that I have had the, the uh, chance to serve as a uh, member of the Board of Overseers of Thayer School and have seen a number of the companies that you see represented up here, and I'll just name a few that are really exciting, that have arisen out of either research that happened at Thayer School or from people who went on from Thayer School to do something um, very exciting out, outside uh, with their entrepreneurial mindset and to bring research to life, as we're here to discuss today. So a really interesting one um, that's a very elegant and simple solution, in fact, is uh, represented by Trey Bien, which is two young women who are in the Engineering 21 Intro to Engineering course, and they happened to come up with an idea that would solve uh, the age-old problem of drinks being knocked over on a tray when you're serving in a restaurant. They won a competition, an entrepreneurship competition uh, that the engineering school put on, and now they have a company. Um, another example, as some of you might have seen in the parade yesterday, is the mobile virtual player. Some of you may also have seen that advertised on NFL games. That's an excellent example of collaboration across the campus where Coach Buddy Tevens challenged some folks to help address an issue of um, injuries in football. And so out from that, from three alums of this school, came a um, fantastic uh, business idea and something that's going to um, help uh, reduce injuries. And then lastly, I'd mention, and this is um, un unfortunately uh, very appropriate over the, over the course of the last month, um, a young woman who took an, her entrepreneurial mindset from Dartmouth, but then went on to come up with the, with the innovation after Dartmouth, um, founded a company called Luminade, bringing uh, solar power to small inflatable lights that are um, distributed in, di in disaster areas and have in fact been uh, present in Puerto Rico and a number of other places where um, people are suffering from many things, including the lack of power. So I just think it's really um, fascinating, invigorating, and, and energizing to have a chance to be exposed to those kinds of examples of entrepreneurship, and, and I think it gives the students and faculty and even alums here a great um, ability to learn from each other and, uh, and improve our own ability to be good entre entrepreneurs. Thank you, Sam. So, Tillman, let me turn to you, and I'm also going to wander over and take a seat with a group of you on the stage. So, you went down an interesting path. You've almost come full circle. You started your career in the private sector, working in industry. You became an academic to teach and conduct research, and yet fairly quickly, you moved in a different direction as a technology entrepreneur, a biotech entrepreneur. Why don't you take a few minutes to describe your thinking and your reasons in that transformation? So in my case, it was a total accident. <laughs> um, and the way the accident happened is I came here in the fall of 98 to work in an area um, uh, where there was a group of faculty at Thayer at the time that was interested in converting biomass to alternative fuels or alternative materials, and I was I had previously spent two years at MIT and then four years, actually four years at MIT and then four years in industry working on technologies that would allow you to do that. But upon arriving here, sort of sat back and, and analyzed <coughs> the true potential um, or the promise of these, these technologies that on the surface all sounded great, but the more you dug in and actually looked at the full life cycle of what it would mean to deploy that at a large scale, realized this is a pretty bad idea. And so, so step one is get yourself out of a job. <laughs> step two then is to find something new or something interesting that you would want to spend your time on. And in my case, I was highly sensitized to the notion, what's the quality of the problem? If you spent eight years of your life, four in academia and four in private industry, working on a problem that you then subsequently realize is a bad idea, the next problem you pick, I think you're going to think about really, really hard. So, so could I just interrupt here with a question? Sure. Did that feel to you as if it was a moment of professional peril? Right? Not many. We generally <coughs> recommend that tenure track assistant professors don't come in, spend a few years, and say the field that you hired me to pursue just isn't going to work. It, it was it was scary to say the least. I mean, it's you know, if you hired me as a career counselor, and I told you, at, I don't know, I was this was. Um, 90, so I was like 28 or something, and someone said to you, like, this guy figured out what not to do in life, and he's 28, it's not, it's not a great career recommendation, I would say. 
But anyway, that's, that's what my, I found myself in. But was fortunate to, to, um, to be given the freedom. At, so I mean, there's, there's a few steps. I mean, you, 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 um, you mentioned some of them. There's, there's, there's inherent pressure. When you're hired to do something, there's an expectation that you're going to continue doing that. And, and I think it's really remarkable how Thayer was willing to say, look, the guy's going to go in a different direction. We're going to leave him alone. That is not normal. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm hugely grateful um, for, the, for the freedom and the, and the degrees of yeah, flexibility I was given to do something new. And in my case, it worked out really well. Um, but that's easy to say, you know, 15 years later or so. Um, back then, it was, those, those were very key decisions that the administration made and, and again, allowed me to pursue something new. And in my case, it happened to be so. It was a very exciting time in biotech when uh, in the fall of 99, it was pretty clear that early in 2000, we're going to have a full sequenced human genome. And there was the expectation that based on that knowledge, there were going to be a lot of new ways of generating therapies based on recombinant proteins. We already had insulin, we already had various clot, uh, blood clotting factors, erythropoietin. These were transformative drugs, but now that we had a blueprint of every single human protein <coughs> and could potentially trans, translate those into drugs, it was, a, it was a very, very exciting time. And what was lacking was technology to translate those, or that information, into actual drugs. And the technologies available at the time were, you know, cumbersome, expensive, uh, required animal-derived substitutes to make them. There was a whole slew of issues with what was the state of the art at the time. And so the proposal to say, we're going to come up with something that displaces all that and is faster, cheaper, gives you more control over the product, um, that was a compelling idea, at least conceptually. And when you are working on important problems, it's easier to raise money, typically. Not so in academia. So what I did is I wrote grants and um, did what every academic does. Like, you know, you write your grants to the NIH and NSF, and they said, that's a really, really important, very, very difficult problem. And if anyone's going to solve it, it's certainly not you. Because <laughs> you're not a yeast geneticist and you're not a glycobiologist, which were the sort of two main expertises that you would need to do this. And so basically all my grants got rejected. And um, Well, that, I mean, that's an interesting perspective because here you are as someone who's got a background in biodegradable plastics yeah. trying to solve an important problem in a completely different area. So the NIH wasn't receptive, yet you pursued. They Persisted. weren't because my track record was not in that area, but I was a bioengineer. I knew how to engineer cells. And so yeah. this was a cell engineering problem at a high level. Um, and yeah, I think... Look, look, the, the funding system we have in this country in, is one of those things where there is no better solution, really, but everyone can complain about it. And, you know, I can be on both sides of that conversation, if you will. But, but in my case, it was just so that they said no funding for you. And because of the magnitude of the problem, though, and in, in particular, the venture community being uh, um, fully exposed to that this potential we cannot translate if we don't have better ways of making these drugs, it was open doors whoever we talked to, and in particular instrumental were, of course, John Ballard, Terry McGuire, and Mike Ross, that at various points were either willing to provide um, expertise and validation that this is an important problem, um, and then John and, and, and Terry early on were willing to, uh, to put a little money into, the, into this venture <coughs> to see whether this guy that is all of a sudden doing something completely different that we didn't ask him to do, whether he's going to be able to, uh, to make any headway here. So I don't want to take up too much time, but um. but it, it, it suffice to say, ultimately, it went well, and so we should come back to that in, <laughs> yeah. in the discussion mm -hmm. and talk about the specifics. And one of the questions I will ask you, so you can start thinking about it, I'm sure it's on the minds of many. Let me is, take notes. Right. <laughs> <laughs> what a good student and professor you are. <laughs> but obviously, you've repeated this now in different ways on different problems multiple times, and so one of the things would be interesting for us to discuss is how it changes the second or third sure. times you do it. Let me turn to Jason now and ask you a bit about your pathway, also a little bit unusual. You graduated from Thayer, you went to work, I didn't mention this in your background, but went to work for Allegro Microsystems, yeah. right? So a private sector engineering yeah. circuit design job. Yeah. After three or four years, you decided to go back and pursue your PhD. A little bit unusual, but not highly yeah. unconventional. But then as a graduate student, you co-founded the company. So tell us a bit about 
that that process, that transition, and if anyone was questioning your sanity at that moment. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I'll, maybe I'll start at the end. And, and my path actually is, I'd say, similar in many ways to Tillman's and what he described. So, um, so I, I graduated from Thayer in actually almost, it's like a 17 years ago at this point. Um, I went to work for a while. But at the moment, I ended up starting a company out of graduate school, kind of the rationale that, that sort of led me to that was many years of, I would say, terrifying anxiety. And that sounds strange, but the, the anxiety was really coming from that I had started in the private sector and had a lot of success. You know, I was an engineer out of Thayer School that went to a company and, you know, the products I designed, um, for whatever reason, I wouldn't say I was a genius or that I was, you know, even really even knew what I was doing. I just had a bachelor's degree. Right. Just, just if I may interject, you were a Thayer graduate, so of course it was a given. As oh, yeah, yeah. Thayer graduate, <laughs> yeah. You were well, a genius. I would say that the Thayer, the Thayer bent on my education was probably a good thing, and you know that I was sort of ch questioned everything and challenged the conventional wisdom at this company. I did things a little differently, and it just turned out the products I designed worked really well and sold in very high volume for a very long time in, in this automotive industry. And I think that's um, a good thing, right? It's a very good thing. <laughs> so so I, come out of, I come out of Thayer, I'm making, you know, at that time, you know, 50K a year. And, and really, to this date, at 50K a year, that was, in real terms, real meaning like what it felt like to me, was the, that was like the richest I was ever in my life, even <laughs> now. Um, but then I see, you know, I design these products, and they're selling, oh, you know, millions and millions of them, every car on the road, you know, 16 sensors a car, um, something like that. And, and I'm, I sort of seeing, I'm seeing that happen. And I'm like, well, I'm making 50K a year. Okay, well. Um, <laughs> for for and, the record, his salary is a little bit better than that now. Well, yeah, Adjusted for inflation. A little bit, a little bit. Yeah. Oh, don't get into In the real details. terms, yeah. Um, but uh, so, so I, went, I had that experience, and then you know, my motivation for grad school was frankly to just learn a lot more and get out there and do something different. It, re it really wasn't say like, oh, I want to go start a company. But you know, I go to grad school, and it's really different. You know, when you're at a, at a company and you're making them like, a lot of money, they treat you really, really well. I'm not to say they pay you more all the time, but they treat you really well. You go to grad school, and you are like nobody all over again. You are just, <laughs> you're the bottom of, you're, you're just above like a homeless person, you know, it's, especially at Berkeley. This is not um, advertising graduate school very well. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's a good experience to go through. You Thank just you. To, you, just break, you have to you know, relearn how to be nothing and work really hard, um, which is good, actually probably a good thing to do at that time in your life. But the whole time, you know, it's the, you know, the kind of the recurring thing that with me about starting companies, it's, really is all about opportunity cost. It's sort of, what could I otherwise be doing? And I think that's really a guiding principle to entrepreneurship in general, is that's the thing you're, you're weighing, is what, would, what is the next best thing I could be doing with my time? And so people talk about risk, and risk in entrepreneurship, I, I don't think it's really financial so much as it is just your opportunity and what you could otherwise be doing. So I'm, I'm in grad school and I'm thinking, oh my god, I you know, just gave up this great job and all this, for all these years. And my biggest fear that whole time was, what if I go here for six years just working my ass off, and at the end of it, I just go back to that same company and the same job, probably paid a little bit more, but less than I would have if I had even stayed there. So my, my fear was always, is this the right decision? And so in some ways, this, the anxiety was what drove me to do something different mm -hmm. out of graduate school. And the anxiety didn't end there. I mean, it, it only really got worse. But yeah, the, the tenure process is actually good for that as well. <laughs> True. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've been through so much of that. It, I'm <laughs> numb to it at this point. Um, yeah. So, uh, so, so starting the company was um, kind of driven by just a desire to do something with what I have learned over the last six years and take it someplace. Um, and and my company came frankly out of mistakes you know it's it's not always like oh we have we are we have this genius idea and it's just perfect and it solves this problem 
you know, I was approached by a couple of people, one of whom had been an extremely successful entrepreneur who had um, taken a, co a company public to the NASDAQ 100. It's really pretty famous in the Valley, and he had a grad student. They were working on some things in solar photovoltaics. And they came to me and they're like, oh, you're an engineer. And I've had this ex experience many times. People come to me and they're like, oh, we have this great idea. We were drinking last night and we thought of this thing. And now you'll be the engineer. You, okay, just make it happen. And we'll be the co-founders. We'll pay you like a thousand bucks. You make it happen. And it was kind of one of those again. And I'm like, well, all right, let's, let's do, you know, we, we got going. And then, um, and then I realized that six months in, like, they, we've got nothing. They, they have nothing. They, this, is, this is garbage. It's not an idea. And so from there, it was, it was kind of all on me. You know, let's turn it into something. And so it was just that experience of kind of no real linear pathway into it. But, but then there I was. And my daughter was born around the same time. And then there I was, you know, doing a startup with uh, legitimate... Um, you know, opportunity cost right. deficit. So days you know. were calm, nights were quiet, and you were slightly motivated to make this. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Right. yeah, exactly. Right. Thanks. Yeah. So I, I want to come back to that. Thank you, Jason. And thanks to each of us for, for sharing a bit your trajectory and the founding stories. And so let me now build on that and, and turn to Sam and, and ask you about motivation and structure and what you think about in either considering to join a firm or, or to invest in or acquire a firm. What do I mean by that? Well, Tillman's spoken about the importance of the problem and finding a problem that really needs to be solved. And so whether that's the, well, there's the problem, then you need the enabling technology to be developed to make it happen. Jason's spoken both indirectly and directly about the importance of a highly motivated founding team and being motivated for a variety of reasons, including um, in, in, intense motivating paranoia about paths not taken. But what else is important? I mean, I've heard some of our board members, including you, speak about those ingredients being necessary but not sufficient. Team comes to mind in terms of the organization that's going to be developing. So what, I mean, what, what do you see and what do you think about when you're making these kinds of investment or joining decisions? Absolutely. Uh, and some of them overlap, but I'll start with joining and then investment might be, um, might be slightly different because it depends on whether um, what stage the in investment is going to happen and whether the team is going to keep being important to that investment. So joining, which I've thought about um, in more recent years, um, the problem statement I think is critically important because sometimes there are innovations that are um, solutions looking for a problem. And in, and in drug development, there can be um, drugs that are repurposed from another company, and there's a hypothesis that they can be used in a certain indication, but maybe that indication doesn't really have an important unmet need. And to me personally, what, if I'm going to join a company and, um, and use my time, as Jason just described, to really dedicate myself to that company, I want to be working on something that is going to matter and move the needle for, for people, for patients. That's, that's what I'm motivated by. Um, so the problem, and then I'd, you know, I'd like to understand that there's a reasonable chance of success. If, as many of you may know, in drug development, the probability of success is extremely no, low. The vast majority of drug development programs fail. So at, you know, at least some technical ses, uh, success regulatory success, uh, market success. These are all things I would think about both for myself in potentially joining a company, but also um, for representing a larger biopharma company that's thinking of making an investment. Um, and, and I don't evaluate that just myself. I'm not, I, um, while I would call myself by training an engineer and a scientist, relative to these folks and relative to the scientific founders and even some of the investors I work with, I'm more of the business person. So, you know, I would share the concept with a number of people. And I think having a network of folks whose um, judgment you rely on and bringing a number of different perspectives to bear before making a decision as important as uh, either an investment or taking a job is really important. And then lastly, the team really matters. And, you know, pardon my, um, I was just going to say something that maybe I won't say now, but um, I kind of have a, I kind of have a rule about what kinds of people I'd like to work with. And so are, I, um, there are certain type of people that you don't run across very often, I'd, I'd say, in the biopharma industry. But 
um, that you kind of want to put a little X against and just say, life is too short to work with somebody who is, for instance, extremely arrogant, always thinks they're right, doesn't think they need a team, and, and just thinks you know, their innovation is the way to go and, and they just need money to, to get there. Um, and also, even if you Can bring- I interrupt you for a second, Sam? In yeah. academia, what's the percentage that has exactly that phenotype? <laughs> you tell me. <laughs> no, I'm, no, from your, I'll tell you my number after you tell me your number. Excuse me, I'll answer that as the moderator. The official answer is zero. Zero, <laughs> zero, yeah, zero. All right, now let's get to the honest answer. <laughs> um, you know, well, what, oh. let, let me say what I was about to say and then answer that. And, then, and that is that although, so that's an extreme um, to phenotype of a person, there also is the chemistry of a team. There can be people who are great people and, and bring uh, great skill sets, characteristics, and even emotional intelligence, but maybe just are not gonna be the best fit or aren't the need for that technology. So having said that, I would say, um, I, I, I don't know what the percentage is that's exactly like I just said. I hope it's low, five or 10%, but I think there's a much bigger percentage of people who are not, um, who are not a completely arrogant egomaniacs, but are naive about what skill sets and what amount of time and what persistence it actually takes to succeed in any particular endeavor and, and um, maybe have to learn to be a little open to coaching and to learn to not be too defensive when people like potential investors and potential employees question deeply what they're doing because they're just doing their diligence. That's part of the business. It's not a, it's not a personal affront. So th that percentage, I would say, is a lot bigger. How big is that? I don't know. That's probably another 60%, I would say. So, so Sam, let me just ask a follow-up question on that point and, and to the point Tillman raised. If you think about startups or think about, if you can, if you have enough experience, more specifically faculty-associated startups, what, what do you see as the most common mistake? Is it a naive over-self-confidence in terms of the simplicity of the task and the rightness of the path? Um. I wouldn't say that's always the case, particularly in, in cases where, um, where academic founders have worked in, you know, in more than one um, startup. Um, so Tillman got better with time, is what you're saying. <laughs> I imagine that's true. <laughs> um, I, I guess, I mean, that's a little bit hard for me to answer because I've only worked with a selection of um, academic founders, and there are multiple models. So I've, I've worked with and acquired uh, lots of companies that were based in academic innovation, mm -hmm. but not all of them had academic founders actually operationally run the company. And so I think the model where the scientific founder remains an advisor mm -hmm and maybe wants to stay in academia and builds a, it builds a team or allows a team to be built in many cases by, say, investors, and, um, and is a productive and effective advisor to that group but is able to let go, I think that's a great model for someone who doesn't want to take their entire career and move it out of academia. Um, I, but back to your, m more specifically to your question, I think um, sometimes not not being um, swift about um, protecting whatever the innovation is from an, from mm -hmm. an intellectual property perspective is, um, is something that, you know, hopefully the academic institution uh, of that um, academic is helping with that, but even, even if so, not all patent attorneys are created equal, as Chris and I were discussing <laughs> earlier. And so, but, you know, making sure that there's great protection is important. And also, I think equally, if not more important, is making sure that what you've done with your innovation is actually something that others can replicate and, um, and not viewing that as something you need to be defensive about, mm -hmm. but viewing that as a way of building credibility for your idea. And just as an important part of the process. Exactly. In drug development, um, I think that's, that's a really big issue, is finding out a little bit too late that, that right. um, results are not, you, that you can't replicate yeah. them. Thank you, Sam. So, so Tillman, you've approached this a little bit differently in that you have remained actively engaged in many, if not all, of the companies you've, you've founded. So tell us a little bit, as, as I said at the outset, I was going to ask this, what, if, what do you do differently now 
as an academic and scientist, founder, co-founder, what did you learn from Glycophy that you've approached well, uh, differently? <clears throat> or did Glycophy go so perfectly well that... Went pretty well, I think, yeah. but, uh, but, but still, I think you, of course, you develop a different perspective and you, you learn things on the way. I mean, one thing in my area that you need is you need a good idea that is solving a meaningful problem, you need great people, and then you need capital to turn those two things into something that is recognized by others as valuable, or you come up with a product or whatever. But you need to get those things to a point where value is recognized in whatever form, whether it's a product or whether it's an acquisition for the technology itself, whatever it may be. And one has to understand that that capital um, has a certain amount of patience. And that patience typically is, I don't know, seven to 10 years. And when you go back to what Sam said earlier, not just the risk of drug discovery, but the time it takes. The average time it takes to discover an antibody and then get it approved is 13 years. So if the money that you're raising has a patience of seven to 10 years, but the value creation takes 13 years, there is, there's, a, there is a discrepancy there that you have to solve in some way. And there are, what's, again, what I love about this field that I'm in is, it's not just scientific problems. It's not just people problems. There are so many dimensions where one can innovate and figure out new ways of doing things. And for example, making sure that your investors are made whole will build companies for the long term. And so with Glycofy, that didn't even occur to me. With Atomab, we have a company now that is highly profitable and is building a portfolio of drugs with 50 partners, 150 programs, 10 antibodies in the clinic. And that's just growing every year. And we have found ways of, of basically uh, rewarding the early investors by buying their shares back. Mm -hmm. And that innovation wasn't really available when the company was started. But you start thinking differently about the problems you're actually solving. In this case, it's, a, it's, it's the problem of the capital you take has certain expectations and you've got to make sure that, that is, those expectations are met. And so that became a dimension that I never even thought about before. Right. But you know, a couple of years ago became a, a, a central part of how do you you know, end up being a good partner with your employees and your investors. And, and I don't know if that right. answers your so, question. Uh, so it's not so much learning how to approach a scientific problem differently, and it's not even so much thinking about how to put together a team or initial financial backing It's all of that, but you've already heard all of that. And so for this one is, a, is sort of a newer dimension that I right. didn't really fully appreciate. Of, right. of course, again, what, what Sam said, the people matter so much. Mm -hmm. It's the most important thing. Mm -hmm. um, at the end of the day. Uh, um, thank you. So, so Jason, let me turn to you, and then I'm, uh, after your answer, we'll open it up to the audience for 10 minutes or so for questions. But you know, you're now in an interesting and different position where you're on the other end of the spectrum that you went through. You're a tenured member of the faculty. You've had students working with you on technology development in your lab. In a different space, you're in the physical sciences, not the life sciences, but the development cycles in your field are it's not an app that you're writing that's no, going to be commercialized long. overnight. There's a long and difficult yep. and challenging engineering innovation pathway. You co-founded a company with some of your recent students. And yep. so tell me how you, you think about what did you learn from your experience as a student and did you, did you think long and hard before deciding to go down this path with PhD students uh, in your lab? I had no choice. They, gr they dragged me. Not, a, not <laughs> kicking and screaming, but they, right. so Tillman knows m my co-founder Eric Den is really talented kid and very motivated. He's not a very talented driver. He crashed the car in my okay. restaurant. Yeah. <laughs> Tillman knows him pretty well. That's the um, next panel discussion. <laughs> yeah. So he he's, has interest in automotive. He's been interested in automotive for, his, I think, his whole life. And so he did some research in battery management with me, which is a really big deal right now and, and, and clearly only going to continue for another 50 years probably. Right. Be if you could deal. just take 10 seconds to describe why battery management is so, important. So uh, battery management is going to be important because it's going to be the backbone of the transportation infrastructure. You know, when, when in, in 30 years, pretty much all light duty vehicles will be electrified in one way or another, whether they're electric vehicles or hybrid electric. That, and I, that's going to, that's true. I mean, you don't have to believe me, but um, so they're, they're, so and batteries are the, the backbone of that. They're the most expensive part. Um, they're the new gasoline, right? They're, that's the, where we store the energy. Um, and then in addition to that, you know, with, with renewable energy, 
batteries are how we store that energy. So when the sun shines, where do we, what, you know, we have excess energy, what do we do with it? So to Tillman's so, point, you've picked an important problem. This is a big problem. It's a huge problem. And battery management is frankly in its infancy and it's, uh, uh, you know, nobody really knows what the hell is going on. It's a chemistry set in a tube and you're making lithium crystals on one side and transforming them into lithium crystals on the other. But there's a lot of things that happen in there. And so our, our, our startup was, and our, and our research was related to both managing lots and lots of batteries that are connected in strange ways in parallel and series, you know, like your flash, flashlight batteries in series, but also, you know, the Tesla has um, 7,000 essentially laptop batteries in it. And so um, taking care of those and managing them well, but then also doing, you know, our big thing we did was add pretty advanced diagnostics, so being able to perturb them and look at what happens and figure out what's going on inside the cell. Um, and so, uh, so Eric was, you know, he wanted to start a company and this is just what he wanted to do. You know, we talked about it a lot um, and, you know, going, th I like to do that like opportunity cost calculator and, you know, what, what, you know, one way to look at it is, you know, Eric, you know, you're young, okay, you can go be an entry level engineer or you can start something and be the CEO and CTO of your own thing. And the way I described it to him was, you know, you know, succeed or fail, you're gonna come out of this thing with, you're gonna come out of this thing in a really good place. So, um, so, we, so we did that, uh, you know, we wrote an SBIR, we got some funding and, um, you know, it, it's, it's a challenging problem. This is one of those that's very capital intensive, um, you know, it's, it scares me still, even right. now. But I, I think they're they're doing really well, and we'll see what happens with it. And them. you're at the early stages of this, so perhaps when Thayer turns 160 in a decade, <laughs> we can have you back for a panel during homecoming weekend again yeah. and hear about. Tillman will have started 17 companies by then. Sam will be <laughs> investing in several interesting ventures, and yeah. we'll hear and about. I'll be the, washed up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the success and <laughs> development cycle of five. So, so thank you all. I, I hope you've gotten a, a sense that this is a rich and challenging both opportunity and environment and one that's extraordinarily challenging and not for the faint of heart to take technologies that can truly impact the world and try and commercialize them. We have about eight minutes left and so I'd like to open it up to the group of you. There are microphones circulating, so please, if you don't mind, tell us who you are when you get the mic and what your question is. So you, sir. I'm uh, John Hanley. I Class of 71 and uh, got my master's degree from Thayer in 73. But the uh, question I have is when you take a look at genetic engineering, artificial intelligence, robotics, uh, they have tremendous impacts on society and national security. They can be used to, you know, for good and not good purposes. And so when do the societal impacts and security impacts enter into the equation in terms of part of the design? I mean, the internet being prime example, force for good, and now we see how the challenges it's creating for our lives. Thank you. Right. Thank you. And so I'll, I'll, let me offer a quick comment, and then I'll, I'll turn to my panelists. I think that's one of the great challenges for us as an educational institution. As we teach students the value of translating their technologies, how do we, in parallel, help them think about the broader context? I will say that this is one of the reasons I personally love being in this privileged position of leading an engineering school at a liberal arts college. We tell our students you cannot you cannot think about the development of technology as the development of technology alone. You always have to be cognizant of the broader context. In the way education, engineering education and research <coughs> are approached here at Dartmouth in full partnership with the liberal arts part of the college, I think is perhaps the best way as educational institutions to make sure those questions are front of mind for our students. But that's a broad answer that doesn't address specific questions that any of my colleagues may think about and wrestle with as they develop their businesses. So why don't I turn it to one or two of you for quick answers. So this is um, artificial intelligence security. Is this your, your question? It's a, it's a debate. I mean, I think there's a debate kind of raging, even at the highest levels, sort of Zuckerberg versus Elon Musk. And they, Elon Musk is frightened of this, and Zuckerberg says it's OK. So I don't know. 
I'm, I'm sort of I'm sort of in between. But certainly, security is a big deal right now, and it's and it's not just software. You know, so like Steve Taylor, for example, one of our other professors at their school would work on security, cyber security, but it's really like cyber physical security is a big deal right now and sort of both hardware and software and especially since a lot of, you know, I think one of the most exciting things in sort of the electrical engineering world is, I call it embedded systems, which is just hardware that runs software, right? So everything has a microprocessor in it now. And so security, um, intelligence, all of this is certainly a huge area that will be people will be studying this for, for decades and right. so I, I'm not scared of it in the near term myself but I would just say what I think is different about Thayer is that we teach the technology part one but then we also spend a fair amount of time to discuss what does this mean and how does it impact people mm -hmm. um, and Alexa was here in the audience one of my students in intro to biotech we just had people in my class from the Innocence Project that talked about how forensic science has been completely changed by the ability of analyzing DNA. And not only that, we had an ex honoree that was in jail for 23 years in the class telling them that without this technology, he'd still be in jail. And so I think that's where you see, whoa, <laughs> this stuff that I'm learning has real impact and touches people's lives. And I think that's the metric that my friend Terry often uses. In academia, we have this obsession about impact. And we have certain ways of measuring it, and I think it sends us down a funnel that is rather narrow. Impact means much more. And I think sort of bringing it to the level of where it's touching people's lives, that's, that's where the real action is. And that has many dimensions. And I think no better place than Thayer to be exploring that. And, and I could bring a corporate perspective, which is not necessarily about artificial intelligence and security, but maybe an analogous place. Um, so in the biotech industry, there have been and continue to be a number of innovations that could, in fact, be used for nefarious purposes. And I think, so for instance, I'll give an example. There are two very prominent companies and, and a couple of others as well investing in gene editing. I just listened to a very interesting and stimulating podcast by the CEO, Katrine Bosley, of a company called Editas. And one of the things she touched on is the corporate responsibility to um, while continuing to pursue what are the, the beneficial for disease cases uses of gene editing, to also be mindful about the possibilities as these technologies um, become more widely used that, that they could be used by many people for inappropriate purposes. And, and then there's the question of what is inappropriate and does society even agree? And, and Jason gave the um, situation where there isn't always agreement. And, and there doesn't have to be immediate agreement, but what, um, what the gene editing folks have done and a number of other companies, I'm sure, gene therapy um, earlier in time and so forth, have decided to at least communicate crisply together. Even though they are competitors, they come together on how can we communicate effectively to the world what are the benefits of gene editing and therefore why we should continue to pursue it even though could be risky to develop and how can we um, be effective in influencing policy to ensure that um, the ability to pursue it for productive and useful purposes for, for human disease are, are um, continue to be both funded and supported, but that um, being mindful and watchful for uh, evolving perhaps even regulation, which I hate to say, but sometimes it's appropriate, um, can come about when inappropriate uses seem to be arising. So it's a difficult question, of course. Yeah, and a provocative one. Thank you for raising that. Other questions? Yes. Hi, uh, Robert Schbund, class of 1980. Who owns the intellectual property? If a student or a professor creates something, does the school take a piece of it, or do they own it at 100%? So the answer is it depends. Um, if there are no federal funds utilizing the invention, so it's something a team of students develops coming out of a class, then we allow the students to own it. And if you were to come visit the Thayer School of Engineering, you'll see a wall of patents on the second floor of Cummings Hall. U.S. patents issued for work done at the Thayer School by people in residence at Thayer, faculty, staff, and students. The borders are color-coded, and so you'll see a fair number of student-only inventions scattered throughout. If it's faculty-based, if federal funds are involved, the university owns it, by Dole Act governs that, the government has rights to it. But we've changed our policies for licensing back to, to faculty 
and staff to incentivize commercialization. So I'm actually going to turn to Tillman, who was the Vice Provost for Entrepreneurship and Tech Transfer at the time policies were changed, just to ask you if you could comment briefly on what we're trying to do and why. I think you already asked the, answered the, the main question, but um, what Bai Dole basically said is this. We, the government, give resources to universities out of, the, out of that work um, come inventions. And we, as the government, don't need to own those because we have found that we're very ineffectual in finding ways of commercializing that technology. So let's give it to the universities and let them do it. And so this has been practiced for several decades now. And, and, and up until recently, we were no different than, than most other places. The university owns it. And then if you're a faculty member that wants to go off and start a company, there's a negotiation that ensues between the faculty and the university, or in this case, Dartmouth, of gee, I want to license it into my company, how much do I have to pay? And we're basically negotiators on opposite sides of wants. The university wants to own as much as possible and get as much meat off the bone, and the faculty at the point has no resources and wants to get it out of the university and wants to get something ha to happen, like, like Jason had described. So that's, so, so that's the status quo in the vast majority of universities in this country. It was my view when I took on this position many years ago that we are in a, a business where the, the, the top of the priority list has to be the attraction of talent, getting more people like Jason to come here and want to be here. And so what currencies can we develop other than salary, other than a new building? What things can we do so that talent that has a choice between coming to the Thayer School of Engineering or going to MIT or Carnegie Mellon or Stanford, where they decide these guys have the best deal in town. I want to go and, 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 and spend my career here. And I felt that this, this tension that I described to you before is in the way of that. If we can get rid of that and find a more direct way of allowing our faculty to start companies, which, by the way, is the intent of the law in the first place. The public, they don't care about papers published. They care about drugs or things that impact them positively at the end. So while that contract is not um, um, explicit, it's implicit that that federal funding to the tune of $40 billion a year will result in something good to the public. And my view was getting it out to be commercialized is the best way to do that. So how can we as Dartmouth be a leader in helping that technology to get into the companies, into the hands of people? like Sam, that know how to raise the money and actually do something with it, as opposed to it just sitting there and mostly collecting dust. So, sorry, it was a long intro. The punchline is this. A year and a half after years of committee work, the trustees of Dartmouth College approved a policy that says the following. If you're a professor here and you invent something and you want to spin off a company, we will transfer the, 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 the patent rights that we have to your company we will take a 3% ownership in the company, and then you spend your money prosecuting the patents, paying maintenance fees, and all the other stuff that comes afterwards. But if you win, we win, because we don't have to lay out any cash to prosecute those patents, but we will still have a 3% ownership that, yes, over time will get diluted, but no cost to us. In fact, we're enabling a faculty member to have impact on the world. Mm -hmm. So Thank we are very unique in that regard. Um, and. Um, I hope that answers your question. You. Uh, only so one other additional. Very quick additional? follow up, and then I'll ask for a very quick response because I'm noting we have reached the appointed hour of Just 11:30. Instead of the federal money component, how about if private money? Can they subsidize professors and students as well? Sorry, oh, what was the question? Private, private money as opposed to, let's say, federal money. Can they subsidize students and professors? There are mechanisms to accept money from foundations, from private organizations to support research. And so either through a donation or a contract that's written with the university that supports research, so yes. So with that, I'm afraid we're out of time. I want to thank you as an audience. I'm, I'm sorry, but we are out of time. We will take questions here individually afterwards. Um, but let me simply say that while I appreciate your attention and the engaging conversation of our, our panelists, I, I hope it's given you a perspective on the importance of innovation and entrepreneurship and technology development in a college and university setting and particularly to the Thayer School. Let me close simply by saying this. When I meet with parents of prospective students and the students themselves, 
I'm often asked about jobs for their sons and daughters four or five years after attending Dartmouth and Thayer. And our job placement statistics are outstanding, and I will acknowledge that. I say at the end of the day, our philosophy at the Thayer School of Engineering is it's not our mission to help our students get jobs. It's our mission to help them create them, to invent the technologies that will transform the world, to commercialize them, and truly impact society and make a difference in the world. That's why this is so important to us. So thank you all for your attention and for joining us. I hope you'll join us at the Thayer School of Engineering tailgate in 15 minutes out on Wheelock Street. Happy homecoming, everyone. Thank you.